I think there's a broader awareness for what what public realm and good landscape architecture can do, and it's it's come a long way from simply just amenity horticulture to the base of the building. Episode 104. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with the head of the Global Landscape Architecture team from Hassel, Angus Bruce. Now, Angus has had more than 30 years of experience working on award-winning projects across Asia, Australia and Europe, including the transformation of Sydney's Darling Harbour and the Geopark Museum in Nanjing, China. In this conversation, Angus and I discuss how Hassel aligns their design work with the business agendas of their clients, the anatomy of Hassel and how landscape architecture works as a whole with the entire design team when they're consulting on a project. Um, And we also discuss the renaissance of landscape architecture and the value of place. So sit back, relax and enjoy Angus Bruce. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business, what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far and with your permission, of course, what might be next, what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Angus, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. How are you? Well, well, thank you and thank you for the opportunity. Greatly appreciate it. How's, uh, how has the, the lockdown been affecting you guys so far or the last few months? I've, I, personally, I've been okay. Um, my role is a little bit uh, all over the place in working with projects all over the, the world. So it's um, not been too much of a transitional difference for me. I'm not really in too much of one location for too long. So, but broadly speaking, I think um, it's, it's been okay. Different geographies, different things. You know, yeah. It's booming in, as you know, booming in China and s- severely maybe the other way around in some other geographies. Brilliant. So you're, um, you're, how would you describe yourself? You're the head of landscape architecture at, at Hassel. You're one of the, the princi- you are the principal there. Yes, yes. How, how would you describe what your role is? Well, okay. So yes, landscape architect. Um, and my role in, within Hassel is as the, I've got the role for the, the, the leadership of the group of landscape architects across all of the studios around the world. Mm. Um, that's about 150 landscape architects, urban designers. Um, my role is not though as a, an imaginary lead designer or the hand of God on projects. It's, it's a facilitator. Right. It's um, very much the, the role of extracting the best ideas and bringing them to the surface. It's allowing um, a wide voice and a wide audience within our design. You never know where the great ideas are going to come from. So Mm. you need to create space for that. So it's a little bit of a facilitator and puppeteer all in one. And and can you just tell a little bit more about the anatomy of of Hassel and like its origins and the kind of scope? Yes, it's uh, Hassel is a it's a design practice. It's architecture, interior design, landscape architecture, and urban design. Mm. It uh, originates in Australia, uh, hence maybe my accent. That's uh, where I've come from, but I haven't been there as long as it's been around. It's been around for eighty years. Um, I'm a little bit younger than that, and uh, so its origins are, are very much anchored in or rooted in Australia. But it's over the years it's spread across. Southeast Asia into West Coast US and into the UK and Europe. 
So uh, over time, it's um, obviously grown architecturally. The interior design portfolio has also expanded, and with that has also become uh, a great opportunity for landscape architecture and the creation of, of good quality public realm. Mm. And how, how does your role as an as an, a landscape architect, how does that intersect with the other components such as interiors and, and architecture? In an ideal project, we're, we're just one design house. There is no boundary. There is no discipline silo of this is my space, this is your space. It's, uh, it's a collaboration of just great designers that have got a different background and training and experience that come together on a project with a given brief and excel the potential of that project. Mm. Um, Mine is obviously very much about the exterior space and um, the creation of the, the, the people spaces. And, and some of times it's referred to as the, the space between the buildings. And that's, um, that's just a voice that I'm one of those in a, in a group, which is trying to project a project to its maximum end result for a client or for a community. Mm. Um, so it's, there's not really a jockeying or a, a jostling. We're all at the table within the Hassel design group, where all the table is equals. There's no hierarchy of oh, I'm an architect or I'm a landscape architect and, and therefore I sit before you or I have a louder voice. It yeah. really is a, a collective of designers. And um, I think that's what makes it really exciting and, and quite dynamic because there is a lot of push and pull around different sector knowledge and different insights into a project and everyone's training and cultural background brings diversity to a, a really rich design outcome. It's a really interesting field, landscape architecture, and it's certainly, and tell me if I'm, I'm wrong, but like it, it's, evo- it's evolved quite a lot in the last, particularly last 20 years. Like it's becoming much more of a, a, a prominent aspect of, of projects, like clients are understanding the importance of it more. Yes. Yes. Um, it, it's a kind of a critical part of, of any large development. I'd actually say it's, it's had a rebirth, maybe rather than a coming of age. You, you go right. back and look at some of the beautiful, essential city parks, London, New York, anywhere else. They all survive on their, their park space, the, yeah. the connection of humans with nature. Um, so, and, and then it's gone into a, a, a phase of, of recycle and real life now, but it's not a, it's not a, a new birth in any way. But I, I do agree with your point that whether it's local government, um, clients, developers, um, communities, the the appreciation and value for space and the outdoors, whether it's an urban and a city civic space or it's nature, the appreciation and value for that is is becoming more and more prevalent in our lives. So Mm. it's, um, we are finding that a lot of projects actually start with landscape architecture and heaven forbid the architecture comes (laughs) later. Um, for some of your listeners, it might sound the wrong way around, but um, we really do strive to try and get projects that are set up the right way. And a lot of times that's set about um, on a brief that's looking at the right engagement with community, the local culture and identity of the place. And um, so that, that has to start with the setting. And, and that's before you bring things in to bear, whether it's a library or a residential or commercial facilities, you have to set the place right. So... A lot of projects, it starts with landscape architecture and, and the civic design. Yeah, I remember we were talking about last time about how, you know, places like in, in Singapore where they've kind of been very much landscape driven and then the buildings have mm. kind of come in. And also mm. in what's happening in King's Cross is, mm. um, you know, that's, they've got, the, they've got the, the context right and then the buildings have kind of become a part of that as, as rather than it, you know, had being a, an afterthought of like, right, what, how do we fill in the space between, uh, between mm. the buildings? Mm. How, how, I think that's the, the identity of place is, is a value to... Um, to clients now, whether they are a landowner or a, um, or a borough, they see that the value of the, the civic space, it's not just the physical built form that's value, it's the place that builds identity, it builds culture. Um, the high street, you elevate the high street to a certain position, all of a sudden the, the tenancy increases, the value of land increases. So I think there's a realisation of the value of place. And how, how have your kind of conversations evolved with clients about communicating the, the value that you're bringing to their, or how do you align your design with their business agendas? It's hard at times to put um, a business agenda to place and, mm. and civic space and, and public realm, really reinforce the word public, when a lot of times there's a business agenda which is uh, maybe at conflict and it's mm. 
pushing more towards a private realm, uh, not, a, not in the sense of a gated community, but where it's seemed to be working so hard to get some sort of economic benefit. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to talk about the, the social benefit and that has a value as the health of the community, whether it's an existing community or a new community for a new development. Um, the social side of it has, has real value. And as we move further and further through um, the challenges we've got with the planet and our cities, uh, you get cities like Singapore that are actually recognising the environmental value of public place and what it does to that city, um, whether it's heat island mitigation and water control, water purification, those sort of things through healthy streets. I think there's a, a, a marching increase of understanding and eagerness to embrace the, the broader value in inverted commas of public place. And it is way more than just the economic return. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you were saying last time as well that you, you're wary about using the phrase placemaking and actually your, 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 yeah. your, your, your approach is, is different to that. Can you elaborate? Um, there is a, there has been a trend in recent years to refer to placemaking by a lot of practitioners and briefs and so forth talk about placemaking making and, um, I just have an aversion to, to that because it somewhat assumes that the place is yet to be made. Um, and it's, it's a little bit disrespectful for the communities that already exist and are yet to get something, um, whether it's a new high street revitalization or it's a new residential precinct or it's a new transport orientated development around their train station and so forth. It's, it's not arriving from Mars. It's, um, it exists as a place. So, the making has to involve the community. So it's, um, it's far more an engagement and enhancement process than a brand new making. And it just seems to be a, uh, at, at times a trend towards this brand new thing we can just deliver and therefore they will come. But if it's not stitched into what already exists and doesn't respect the community or the heritage of place and so forth, mm. then it might not be as powerful as it could possibly be. Got it. So it's kind of much more embracing the local, what's already there, as opposed hmm. to, yes, assuming that well, it's blank. We, well, assuming it's blank, and, and that's, that's not the case, and that's every landscape architect. You're dealing with, a, you're dealing with an existing soil structure. You're dealing with an existing wet weather and climate pattern that you have to design to, and you should be dealing with an existing social infrastructure, local economy. All those things need to be woven in. There's no blank, blank slate, per se. And, and, and when you're working with uh, you know, private clients, for example, what are their, you know, how, how do they view the landscape? How do they view this, this aspect of kind of the, the experience around their, their buildings? Well, it's, uh, private clients are very much the same in, in a lot of ways of government agencies, whether it's local or at a state or federal level, wherever we are, that the private clients value the that's the address that's the identity it's the a lot of times it could be referred to it's it's the external and public space that is the instagram moment um other than the you move to the restaurant and it's the, the food food arrangement on the plate but yeah. the actual experience the emotion if you were to do uh, an assessment of a place you look at the, the that typology of photography it's all about the enjoyment it's the emotional experience so private um, clients definitely see that because that's what adds value. It's the draw card. It's the return ticket. Um, if it's an enjoyable place and it's an emotionally connected place, then people will return, which is great for food and beverage. It's great for the high street. It's great for yeah. um, a commercial address. Um, and, it, and it brings a level of um, social engagement, which creates soul for the place. So right. developers and private clients see that value. Because um, it's a competing space. Why would you come to my landscape precinct, which is the, the front door of the setting for this residential complex versus that commercial complex and so forth. So I think there's a broader awareness for what, what public realm and good landscape architecture can do. And it's, uh, it's come a long way from simply just amenity horticulture to the base of the building. Yes. Yeah, it's become um, sort of integrated into the whole identity and brand of, of, these, bus of, these, of these businesses. How do you... Yeah. How do you typically, how does Hassel typically find clients? Different angles for different geographies. Um, obviously, we have a, um, we 
have a, years of reputation and um, relationship building with clients in Australia and Asia markets, and and a lot of times that's that's a, a relationship we spend a lot of time fostering and, and maintaining. So projects um, luckily come through mutual dialogue and, and discussion around potential potential parcels of land or potential government um, adjustments to funding and so forth. Um, in other geographies, ideally, it's uh, you're doing it through reputation. Um, I think we've talked about before, a, a lot of our landscape architecture isn't actually for hassle as architects, it's also for other architects. Um, and I'd like to think that's because the work we're doing has strength in its design rigor, that the, the, the work actually stacks up, there's evidence beyond it being a a lovely photograph when it's finished that it actually it actually works for the end client user which is not necessarily the developer it's the residents who are going to live there or the commercial users that are spilling out from their workspace into the public realm mm. so getting clients or projects ideally your work speaks for itself and that drags you into an opportunity at least to have a conversation and how how do you go about measuring what is a, what is a, a successful scheme is if you're able to, like, well, we we, we have um, obviously there's the, you know, the the traditional way of measuring it. You you, know, you photograph it, you write about it, you submit it for awards, and, and hope your peers judge it as um, successful. Um, but clearly, they're not the users. So the way that we've been testing our, the success of our public realm is to do what is traditional in in hotel hospitality and interiors is is to undertake a post occupancy assessment of the work, which is the collecting of data of users of that space. So it's going out and doing both digital assessment and also physical assessment of people that are in those landscape spaces in the public realm and, and doing the hard yards of testing whether they're enjoying it and when are they there. We, we've been using a lot of um, data to map users, the time scale that they're in the, in the public realm, where are they gathering for how long and using technology, obviously with every city moving more and more to a more intelligent and smarter city, the ability mm -hmm. to leverage data in a way, not that's invasive in any way on personal information, but just knowing that an individual is pinged in a certain space within public realm, you can see how long they sit, how many of them gather, whether they're sitting in the area we designed for the best maximum shade or that the playgrounds are being used for the right hours or that you can see that the egress out of public realm at two in the morning on a Sunday is actually going where we had hoped the safe routes of passage would be. So you can use, um, and we've been doing that on several projects lately of two, 10, 20, 40 hectare scale sites um, where we're using the data to just post review the success of those spaces. So mm. it's, it's pedestrian modeling in a lot of ways after the event not in advance of the, and in the forefront of design process. It's af actually afterwards to see if the modeling and dwell time um, is actually working that way. And you can do that through um, not only just mobile phones, you can do it through hashtags and what are the common predominant words used to describe a space. Um, and if that predominates to be hashtag joy or delight, then you know that you <laughs> might be going down the right path of something that was successful. And that's really interesting, actually kind of using sort of social media and the, the engagement that people are having on online, if you like, about a space to, to gauge its impact, if you like. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, if what you're trying to create is, is a human experience, you have to yeah. be able to go and work out how to gather that emotional connection to that place. Um, are there, in, in your experience, you've, you've, you've kind of worked all over the, the world and just looking here, you know, places, places in you were involved in the in Darling Harbour in Sydney? Correct, correct. And, and um, also, not as glamorous, but where I'm from in Croydon. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's, an, it's an eclectic... Well, they're all glamorous in their own way because they're all a design challenge. And that's the excitement of being a designer is, is working with different briefs and different budgets and uh, different communities. And um, fortunately for me, with my role, of it, it can be at one end of the scale and it's... It's a Darling Harbour um, re revitalization of a central core public realm area in the middle of Sydney mm. through to a museum in Nanjing or it's, it's the relifing and improvement of the high street in Croydon. Um, 
that's what comes with and maybe it comes with age and time and experiences it allows you to um, connect with projects around the world but none of those are done you know by me it's a collection and a team of individuals and as I said at the outset it's um, you're involved as a curator of the right team that allows the best outcome what, and pulling the right people together of course what, what makes what makes a successful relationship between you and other consultants I believe the the best relationships are where you're you're on the same page and and it's not about an exertion of muscle or ego or that it's the, everyone's collectively chasing the same um, outcome to the brief and which ultimately should be the end user not not necessarily the investor per se um, it has to work it has to work and that's not just a it's not a monetary return it's it's that public experience and the space does work the forecourt outside the theater does actually functioning for pre-ticketing security bag checks those public spaces need to also work when the the forecourt for the theater is closed mm. and that it's not a desolate space um or that it's prone to to risk or human harm so there's this collection of consultants that need to be able to advise and input on the same page to the same end goal um, if you've got a group that are all after their own thing, it ends up looking like Nana's knitted rug and it's yeah. got a thousand bits of different colored wool and it doesn't quite stitch together properly. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested as well to, to understand a little bit about um, how, how your role has evolved over the last 10 years in, in Hassel. Okay. Well, it's um, when you arrive into an existing business from another design firm um, it takes a while to get your feet on the ground and understand how you can contribute and um, cultures are slightly different but ideally um, I would like to think I, you, you move with a culture that fits with you mm. so my role has shifted slightly from being very Sydney landscape architecture focused to what it is now which is a caretaker of our landscape architecture offer um, across all of our studios, nine of them. Um, so it's, it's a, a gradual transition of accountability, um, responsibility, and, um, and it is far more a, still a mentoring role for a range of individuals, but I, I have a bit of a mandate for myself. I need to remain 60% of my working month. I use month rather than day because it never works out that way. The 60% has to be on the tools, so to speak. Um, actually in the space of designing and, and what I'm trained to do, um, what you evolve to become might not be necessarily what you enjoy the most. So filling your day up with that can maybe make you go a bit stir crazy. So, so it's um, trying to hold, hold on to the roots, I suppose. So you're, so you're still actively involved in the actual designing of, of things, drawing, oh, yeah. doing that kind yeah. of stuff. It hasn't become a sort of... Essential. No, no, I think that I, I could never, never see myself moving to a role which is a managerial thing. And um, I, I, I don't think we really have anybody who sits in that space in, in Hassel at all. They're all creatives at their roots and they're still creatives now. And it's just with years of experience, they've got mm. uh, more creativity um, under their belt. But um, no, I need to maintain a connection to the craft. Otherwise, I, I don't think I could perform as a manager um, because you, you just lose touch. Um, I, I need to still be involved in the, the detailing of the joints, the specification of the stone, um, and, and working with a contractor on site, trying to work out what's quality installation or what needs to be pulled out and done again. Right. Um, so yes, and, very and, uh, essential part. And, and what, what, staying, staying. what What brought you to the, the UK? How come you moved from Sydney to... Um, well, the choice was um, a, a very deliberate and conscious one. Um, in the role of, of head of landscape architecture at Hassel, you, you're trying to grow the business of, of that unit of designers. Mm. And we've been um, in the UK for a while, but it was needing to, I felt that it needed to get more traction and more, um, um, uh, I suppose, more, more skin in the game to try and move it along and, and, and open the door so that it could add muscle to the rest of the work we're doing around um, our other locations. So opportunity arose um, to pack everything up and move here and actually be 
be here employing very key seniors to, to grow the team and, and give it as much guidance and mentorship as possible. Um, so it uh, was a very conscious move to try and not just keep furthering what we're doing, what I think we're doing well in Australia and Asia is to pack that up and then try and bring that into the fold in a robust way and, and make the UK and London studio my home studio. And, and how, do you, how, how do you find um, working on numerous international projects? Does that involve you traveling a lot then to other countries or are you able to kind of work um, you know, from a consolidated position in London internationally? Um, the, the role across projects internationally, it's different depths of engagement. Some of them it's a peer review or design oversight role. Um, but back to that point of being actively engaged, I try to make sure there's a range of projects that I'm physically um, an integral part of the team's output, whether it's my own output or part of the collective um, design output. So some of it's involved travel um, and for a period of time that, that requires a lot of committed travel to build the relationships and trust of the clients. Um, but we have been pre-COVID-19 quite well connected as a business um, and mm. as a team. You know, it's, as a group of landscape architects, we share our skills, we share, share the resources and our insights and knowledge to leverage the 24-hour clock to some degree. Um, so we've been doing that for a while. So this technology that you and I are doing now, where we're, whether we're on whatever platform it is, um, engaging with our clients virtually has been a state of play for, for several years now. And we do the same with our own design reviews, our critiques of projects. We're in our offices, they're, they're pin up, they're wall spaces, um, mm. and we're reviewing live walls. Well, we have a, a similar model where we, we, we review virtual walls and everyone from the team can insert into the, um, the dialogue on screen. And that's obviously that's being used extensively now that everyone's working from home. But um, before COVID, um, it was a platform that allowed us to bring the best experts from different studios into a project rather than only working with the team that's local to that job. So it's, it's um, something we've worked really hard for with as a firm to try and make sure we leverage as otherwise the risk is you, you're just cookie cutting yeah. the same types of uh, teams in every location and it, they might not always be the best combination. Yeah. How, how, how does um, Hassel develop its sort of internal business culture, if you like? What are the things that make Hassel unique from the inside? Unique? Unique? That's... Um... That's trade secrets, is it? <laughs> no, um, I don't know if there's a uniqueness per se. Um, I think culture is probably one of the things that makes a practice or any practice unique, and it's what keeps keeps individuals in the firm, and they um, they work their way up their career within the one business, whether it's changing locations, but stay within the firm because the culture aligns with the individual. Mm. Um, so the uniqueness may well be just its its culture, but I think one of it is clearly the fact that it has these design streams within it as one design house, but there you find a lot of firms might have one or two of these, but to have landscape architecture to the size and scale that we are, and the same with interior design, the same with architecture, is a unique offer um, to existing staff, future staff and clients. Um, is the it? point around building that culture, it's, it's from the leadership. If we're not united and we're not all on the same page, we're not living that culture, then it, it just fractures. So it has to be a unified leadership group that, that builds and or breeds that culture. Do you, do you ever have any kind of cross migration from like architects who are in the, the architecture section? They're like, you know what, actually, I want to be involved in the landscape part. And they kind of if, if migrate. Really well, like, yeah, well, if we're doing really well with what we aspire to be, it is one practice. That's it. Right. And the idea of silos of disciplines or genres that are defined by your degree, um, if studied, um, then we're, we're probably off message. Ideally, it's a collection of designers. You might aggregate or congregate in family groups where you speak the same language where I'm speaking plant material and external experience and public space and others are dealing with 
interior finishes and um, the design and creation of hotel spaces that you might group together. But if we're doing our job really well as, as Haskell, then we're not worried or about migration or there isn't really a feeling to need to jump ship and get on another boat. Um, it doesn't exist. Right. Okay. So it's actually in, in the office, how do, what does it look like? Is, I'm, I'm imagining it's not then just the um, architect. The architects are sitting over there and the land is over here and it's never the, never the two shall meet. No, so it's, it's, uh, ideally, the, the, whilst we've got all of the architects and landscape architects and interior designers in, in each studio, they are grouped around projects um, where the, the aim would be to try and ensure that you've always got the best people available on a project, mm. full stop. Um, qualifications, experience all come into play. So if there's a seating plan at any one time, it's quite dynamic in the sense that you've got people grouped together to deliver that particular project. Um, yeah. And it's not there for all landscape architects together. Um, but it, it depends on the scale of the projects at the time. So large projects will have large groupings of of, of architects together, clearly. Um, they're, they're working on extensive, complicated train station, uh, transport orientated development projects that, that creates critical mass. Then you've got a group of them grouped together and you'll have less landscape architects involved. Mm. Um, and, and equally, as I was saying before, we, we have a significant amount of work we, we undertake for a raft of other architects, um, for other architecture firms in different locations. It might nearly be 40% of our work globally is um, for other firms. So that warrants a project team just focused on the landscape architecture and the public realm that are dedicated in a, a portion of any one studio working on those projects. And it doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the business. Ah, so um, they're not grouped in silos in that way. It's, um, it really is, is best people, best team for a project. And they're not always in the same studio, as we're saying. You leverage technology and work is done between locations. So there isn't, is there like a, a kind of a head office as such or is no, it much, it's much no. more sort of networked these days? I, maybe um, I'd like to think it's now London, um, but that's tongue in cheek. <laughs> um, I'm sure Shanghai think they are. Um, no, there's no, there's no head office. There's, uh, there's different studios of different sizes, which are all driven predominantly based on the economy of their location. And, stronger and, economy, stronger opportunity means we have a, a larger presence. Right. And in, and in terms of when a new studio or new office opens up, how does that process work? Is it normally project dependent or there needs to be a strong business case for more projects coming out in that office or do you open satellite offices for, for individual projects in that kind of Yeah, way? Yeah, we tend to be, it'll be, if we open an office, it'll be on the basis of um, a project uh, satellite, as you say, um, example. If anything, we've been intentionally reducing over the years the number of studios. Um, to consolidate and, and increase critical mass, um, mm -hmm. to aggregate our, our, our skills and resources. It makes it um, a stronger argument for hiring and finding talent is that they're in certain geopolitical pinpoints that make sense um, where we can not only there is a client mix and, a, and um, receptiveness for what we offer that's one reason the other is uh, retention of, of talented staff and obviously finding new staff mm -hmm. so over time we've been aggregating the number of studios down intentionally so that we can have that, that core critical mass and the site office really is the you know one version of you may have a flash moment in one location because there's a project of scale that warrants local presence and obviously the shift that's happened in um with the pandemic, um, you will see that there's probably now going to be 47,000 small offices out of the second bedroom as, as another version <laughs> of uh, future setups for a whole range of firms, as in people are happy with doing what they're currently doing and it works. Do I yeah. need to go back to the office? So we'll see what that comes, um, how that comes to bear in the future. And, and in, in terms of how you guys have entered into new sectors has it has it been very much like sector-led typologies so like you know we've done a lot of work in transport infrastructure and now we want to do work around you know around stadiums or was it more landscape architecture is kind of deemed a sector in its own own right no um this the sectors are for us it's it, it very much is about the collection of like-minded clients 
Um, right. It's not necessarily about the what it's a synergy between what we're offering and what they need and what they require. At the end of the day, a sector for us is a, a collection of clients um, of a similar typology, but a lot of them overlap. Uh, the, the, the things in, um, that you apply in one sectorial space does very strongly overlap into, into others. Um, what does retail offer to the ground floor or the inter intermediary floors in a commercial tower? How do you use commercial workplace as a rethink on uh, health and education and what you're doing for the faculty um, departments and how they work together. So there's a cross pollination of a lot of the sectors um, that, that we, that there isn't really a standalone space. If we're doing aviation, it relies a lot on the experience of the arrival and departure journey, which is an overlap back into landscape architecture, the airport itself fine, but how do you, what's the travel journey from parking your car or being dropped off by the Uber? to the airport, through the space, that retail experience. Um, there's a whole, as I say, cross-pollination of sectors that none of our sectors really stand on their own in a siloed sense, the same as I was saying about the, the design disciplines. They, they, they work with our clients because you can borrow the expertise right. across boundaries, um, which I think is another um, sweet spot that we are lucky to have is we do have expertise, but that expertise does speak a similar language that allows it to cross over into other, uh, other client groups. And, and, and what, what's the, the future for Hassel in for the rest of 2020? And what do you see are the, some of the opportunities and some of the biggest obstacles? Um, well, for Hassel, I'd, I'd like to think that our geographic, our diversity, our, um, design diversity and to the point you just made a moment ago about the sectorial um, diversity allows us to have a degree of resilience. So the, the, the year of 2020 and forward, whilst we're in this quite unknown territory um, about where things are going and which, mm. which clients and which governments are spending for which purposes and um, uh, where, where are design opportunities going to be most valued. Um, I'd like to think that that diversity in, in several spectrums allows us to be quite um, robust and resilient going forward. Um, challenges or trends, I think there's, uh, you know, before COVID-19, um, there was definitely the, the, the real uh, pressure on the, the wider built environment to address climate, uh, to address sustainability environment, um, and to have a more positive, meaningful impact as designers on the shape of our cities and what we're doing for the inhabitants of those cities. Mm. And um, so that's, that's a different, a definite trend that we could all see coming for the last 15 years, but the alarm bells and the, 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 the loudness of the voice has obviously been most widely heard uh, across all points of the globe in the last five years. Um, that though correlates with now a, a rethink of um, social distancing and how transport works and the value of public space, which goes back to our very first points. I think post COVID-19, um, there will be a, a shift on, on how people might want to value their outside time and how they're, they're dealing with their inside time and how they can actually integrate and communicate. And it might do everything from technology change to um, how you actually make time for yourself, yeah. which is you know obviously one of the challenges in this, technology link up phase in time of our lives we're all doing now is you forget to take the headphones off and unplug and um, go for a walk and get some grass between your toes um, <laughs> which you didn't do when you're at work either in an office but uh, it feels like you're forgetting it way more now in these times yeah no well, like we like we were saying earlier it's it's so easy to kind of be immersed in a, a virtual identity um, mm. And that comes, that has its certain productivity benefits and, you know, the, this wonderful kind of networked offices that we can create, but it also has its um, constraints and, you know, this, the, the impact of being dislocated from your physical oh. environment. Yeah, we're humans at the end of the day. So the, the, the water cooler moments, the chance to have a passing coffee, um, to check in on your colleagues about how, Last, last weekend's football match went, all those sort of um, banter things that happen that build the collegiality as a group um, are at times missing because you've mm. clocked in on a, a one-hour time slot to address in a topic and you forget to maybe have some of those more important um, human connections which, which our 
previous design studio environments offered maybe more so than technology does currently. Yeah. And, and likewise in the, the value of, like you were saying, the public space in the city, I think, mm. you know, and I, I know my personal experience of the last few months, the park outside has been just the absolute, it's not the greatest of parks, but it's, it's been an absolute gift to be able to go outside and, yeah. uh, and, and, and sit inside. And I think obviously a lot of businesses and how offices are going to be and developments are going to be kind of restructuring and reconsidering how they're going to be operating spatially. Um, public space is going to become an even more important well, part of that conversation. Good. There's two definite trends that I'm seeing currently is, is not only the public space within the city and the peri urban fringe, it's actually the um, significant spike and uptake in uh, engagement with, with nature, with wild. Mm. Um, pack a bag, a picnic, actually do a two hour walk to find a spot that's just yours um, where maybe there is no radio reception and you can't have a Zoom call um, <laughs> uh, whilst your kids are floating down the river. Like it, I think that you're seeing two distinct trends. There's this urban connection and peri-urban connection to public space. And then there's this, this call to wild, which is mm -hmm. very much, a, um, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a big, big push at the moment where you're just seeing lots of people pack up, which is pushed again by this trend to do staycations. You know, the, the, you can't fly. So I might as well pack everyone in the car and go for a day experience somewhere. Um, and that invariably involves a real connection to nature. Have you have you noticed that there's a, a difference between how the relationship between nature in the UK is from how it is in, in Australia? You can survive the nature in the UK. You, get, <laughs> <laughs> you can, you'll get bitten in Australia. Um, so yeah, there's a definite uh, relationship difference. You'll get, yeah, you'll get bitten or get lost maybe <laughs> in, in the Australian bush. Um, there's a, I think it's one thing that my children have, have noticed is the ability to go out into the forest it's safe. without <laughs> safely without shoes on. Um, and there is no leash per se. I don't have a leash on my children. I'll qualify that, but I mean the, uh, the virtual leash, uh, that they're able to just go. Whereas, um, that's not something they've culturally been brought up with, mm. uh, especially being bare feet. Um, that's not what you would do. So there's a definite, a definite difference in that sense. Um, but I, I do see that there's a similarity of the, the desire to be connected with nature and that is um, becoming even more paramount as people are finally released from their lockdown and being set free. Uh, they, <laughs> they, they tend to be running a little bit further than the park across the road from you um, because it's still too close to home. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Angus, uh, thank you so much. I, mean, that's, I think that's a, a great point to kind of conclude on there and, and thank you so much for your expertise and your insights into um what it is that you do and what and what Hassel does so thank, thank you. you again for the opportunity my pleasure brilliant see you later thank you and that's a wrap thank you so much for listening and don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.